first, I uh, want to thank you all, each of you, for coming tonight. Mm. This is an intentional choice in this moment to come and be in community with each other after such an incredible last two weeks. And so I thank you for the trust that you put in this shared space together. I um, thank the Tewa Nation for our capacity and ability to gather on this land together in this unceded territory. And much respect to my father who's here. I don't know when's the last time you came to one of my talks, <laughs> but it's uh, amazing to have my family here with me. And thank you also to all the people that I've met with over the past couple of days. It's been such an honor to be in relationship with you all and to learn so much about what's happening here in Santa Fe. It was so nice to not have to come in as like professor, but get to come in as friend and um, interlocutor and co-conspirator and ally uh, and accomplice, I hope, as well. Um, so tonight I thought what I would do is a combination of things because I, you know, I think a lot of times I, I prepare for a talk before I get to the place. And what was so great about having Joanne as like my guide and um, host and site Santa Fe is that I got to meet with people beforehand and I have time to talk with folks. And then as I was here, then so many things have happened since I've just been here. And so it helps me to be able to step into the space tonight as someone who at this age and stage in my career feels like I can just come and be with you. I don't have to have a stack of papers and something I just read, which is what I used to do early in my career. Um, but I thought maybe you want to know a little bit about me. And so I'll tell you a little bit about me. And I see, shout out to the young people in the audience. Let's give them a hand. Give yourselves a hand. So happy that you're here. Thank you for coming. Whoever made you come, thank you. <laughs> um, but I, um, I'll tell you a little bit about me because of y'all. And if I can be helpful to you in any way, you should let me know. I'm easy to find on the UCLA website, and I can also handwrite out my email address because I always forget my cards. They're sitting in the Airbnb right now. Uh, so part one of this talk, I'm going to try to do it in 40 minutes, is um, just about a little bit about me and what I do. What, what's my like professional life been up until about three years ago? A little bit before that. And then I want to share a story of transformation, um, something that changed the way that I think about my role as an educator and also as my role as a human being on this earth. And I would love to get your insights and feedback about that so that I can share that time and learn from you. And then third, I want to talk about briefly where we are right now in this moment together. And maybe do a little bit of practice together about this moment. Is that cool with everybody? Does that sound good? OK. OK, so um, I put these up here mostly because of the art. Um, Fabiana Rodrig Rodriguez did, this, did the cover to my book. This was actually a, a, something she had already done, um, a poster she had done for a conference. And I asked her, and she said, yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, it's, what's your book on? Black and Brown Coalition? Absolutely, here it is, no problem. Um, public art is just amazing. Um, and then uh, this book was the first one that I wrote, and it was about black and Mexican coalition in Los Angeles from 1940 to the present. Why did I write this book? Well, I am, as you can see, the physical embodiment of a coalition between a black man and a Mexican mother, black father and a Mexican mother. So the story that I knew was very different from the one that many of us are told. And you can, you can take this story and extrapolate it, apply it to any other kind of story about two or three different groups of people that appear to be racially different and are always being told that nothing that they have ever done has ever resulted in a coalition. What happened was I was at a protest and Someone was, had the mic and was like, black people, brown people, we got to get together. We've never gotten together before. We got to put all our differences aside. And I was like, 
that's not my experience. I feel like there's been a lot of stories that I've heard where black and Mexican people, who were the, the particular people at this protest, um, actually have a shared history of coalition building. Why don't we know that story? Why is the only story we know is like all the fights we have in prison, all the gangs, you know, not to say that that doesn't happen. That's real. Anti-blackness in a lot of different um, Latino uh, cultures is real. In indigenous communities, it's real. Prejudice from black people against immigrants is real. However, there's another history that we can draw on that's even more real. So has anybody written that? No. Okay. Maybe that's the one I should write. So that's what I wrote. And it was so affirming to get people to, who came to me after book talks I would do and say, hey, I, I, I recognized my story in that book. Because I decided that the thing that um, everybody can connect to in terms of a history of shared um, uh, fight for liberation is actually the soundtrack. So what's the music? that people are listening to in common. Why is Richie Valens so important in black rock and R&B history in Los Angeles? Why are like what especially Chicanos in LA refer to as oldies all like black R&B, right? So what's the shared um, soundtrack, but then also like what's the shared space that makes that soundtrack possible? What are the conditions of like segregation and spatial segregation that make that possible. So I wrote about things like um, spaces like Chavez Ravine. Have you heard of the story of Chavez Ravine? Maybe not, yeah? Some people. Chavez Ravine was this community all the way up until the 1950s. It eventually became Dodger Stadium. But it was a community that was mixed, <clears throat> mostly, mostly Mexican, some blacks, some Jewish folks in Los Angeles. And this was, um, this picture here at the top is Chavez Ravine before it was cleared. So it was marked like by, um, to try and keep this short, um, urban renewal like process as um, a place where, uh, where something called eminent domain for those folks who have not heard of it was utilized in order to clear this away because they said, oh, there's just, this is a slum. I mean, the, the publicity about this started very early. Um, as it does with communities when people want to get rid of communities, they start saying things like, it's not their fault, they're poor, so they don't know, they just live right on top of each other, they, they got lice, they got tuberculosis, like we just got to help these people out and build some projects where, or some low-income housing where we can help them to live in an orderly fashion, where the streets are clean, where they have access to street lights and blah, 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 right? So they're not thinking about, however, all of the ways that community is enacted and animated and ancient in these spaces, right? Where they're not thinking about the panaderia where people have been going for generations, the churches where people were confirmed over many generations, the barber shop, the auto shop, um, all of those things that make meaning in people's cultures. So when they clear this away and then nearby, they build five freeways in an intersection that start to then create this post-war landscape that we know as Los Angeles. People stayed though, people protested. It's not like this story of like total wipeout. It's years of protests, organized protests. And a lot of people say, well, but they lost. Yeah, but this woman that they dragged out here, the police, as the bulldozers were waiting next to her house, <clears throat> she's still alive, she's still telling her story. And this quote unquote failure was rehearsal for future successes of coalitions of black and brown people in Los Angeles. So it was important to tell this story. Why? It's not just the story of a developing city where eventually this is cleared to make way for low income housing, but then the city of Los Angeles sells it um, so that this, to the, because the Brooklyn Dodgers become the LA Dodgers and then they make Dodger Stadium. So Dodger Stadium is sitting on this land that was once Chavez Ravine, that was once Tongva land. So I write about spaces like this because what comes out of places like, like these catastrophes and disasters for people of color are spaces like Whittier Boulevard. Many people have probably heard of Whittier Boulevard because it's a very famous cruising spot. You can see here, we have, like this is an older picture, right? Lowriders become really, really important in the post-war culture. Why? Number one, 
people are totally displaced by all of this urban renewal that's happening. It's not just Chavez Ravine, it's a lot of different communities that are wiped out, a lot of freeways being built to make way for this like new vision of what the West is gonna look like, all a vision that does not incorporate the ideas of people of color. But what happens when you lose that kind of space? What happens when you don't have anywhere to congregate that feels like familiar? You make space in other places. And this is what Whittier Boulevard becomes in East Los Angeles. So you can see uh, the street lights there. <clears throat> they were um, put in as regular street lights, but there's also some floodlights there you can see. And those were put in because they wanted to discourage people loitering in these areas. But this became actually a perfect site for cruising because when the floodlights are on, you can see the artwork and the craftsmanship that people put into their cars. Who's doing this with their cars? Black and brown people, mostly. There's all these amazing stories about folks who were um, brutalized by police during the Zoot Suit attacks in the 1940s, um, where black people are like handing off their keys to Mexican Americans who are being chased by the police. Hey, take my car. And it's a, it's a low rider. Or, and and the, the low riders also become really important at this time because of sound. Why is sound? Because there were all these incredible advances in radio technology. This is the first time that radio becomes a mobile event. So in the 1950s, people start putting radios in cars. So now, wherever you go, you can announce who you are but through your radio, through what you're playing on your radio. So a soundtrack of this space becomes very important. And what is it? It's mostly oldies. It's mostly black R&B. It's mostly Chicano rock. It's um, later on, it becomes a lot of other things, rap music in particular, uh, R&B also, punk music. But it's all about black and brown people living and working close together. The artists, the craftsmanship that goes into these cars, it's because a lot of the people who were working in the Boeing um, factories, who were in war industries, transfer their skills to cars and People would, like, the whole family, after church on Sunday, go work on the car. Everybody, like, don't touch the car. Like, you better not touch the car unless you're doing something, like, washing it, right? All these politics about the car. This is my uncle's car. I'm sure everybody's got a story. Like, you better not touch that car. You better, like, be careful with the tires. You see people, like, washing the tires down by hand. All those little things that make a community, community making. So when city planners talk about, oh, no, 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 we took that community out but we're putting them all over here. But what if the place means something to you? What if the place you go to every Sunday means something? So my, my interest in space became really, really key at this point, was like, what are people doing? There's these floodlights and they've just lost their communities. They have these low riders. They're able to jack their cars up when the police come so that they, they're not arrested or given a ticket for having their cars too low. So they make the, you know, um, all this ingenious stuff going on that's happening in community, where does that go? It's not just the fun stuff. It's the daily practice of coalition. So even though the stories are black and brown people always fighting, yeah, they, they, black people lived over here, Latino people lived over here, white people lived over there, yeah, but when it came down to Dodger Stadium, everybody was at the courthouse. Everybody was at the dance together. This is what you would see in LA. A lot of these folks, these, and you can't see him here, I don't know, it got cut off, but a lot of white DJs became really famous in the 1960s, late 50s, early 1960s, Hunter Hancock, all these people who, Art LeBeau, who became really, really, really famous because they would host these parties outside, at that time, of the city limits, like Pacoima, El, El Monte, um, and this would be the audience, because it's LA. LA is different from like Tulsa, Birmingham, Chicago, but it was just, as one of my colleagues, Gerald Horn, says, it, rainbow racism. It's just different. It might look like, oh, it's not this kind of segregation. Still, a lot of racism in Los Angeles, a lot of racism. But look at these kids, right? Making something in 1963 that has yet to be announced, but is going to come in real handy in 1968. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? The soundtrack is really important but the congregation is also really important. So when Richie Valens, people ask Richie Valens, oh, when you write La Bamba, like who taught you how to play a guitar? The black guy, 
that worked with my parents and lived across the street, but they, he worked with my parents in the factory. I learned guitar from him. That's the stuff that's so important. What is it? It's the stuff that makes history, but not the history books all the time. This is what I learned from my mentor, George Lipsitz. Groups like the Jaguars. If we had more time, I'd play you some music from them. But this, this actually Hunter Hancock, who had a show um, called Rhythm and Bluesville, and he had them on his show, and they went to Fremont High School, which was quite integrated at that time. But also, there was a lot of, so there was a lot of intermixing, but the reason it works here is because the sounds can mix together. The R&B, the, the, um, the styles. <clears throat> this, when I said, you know, these are things that people are making in 1963 that come in really handy in 1968, 69, 71. Cesar Chavez is like, we need help with this great boycott. And the Black Panthers say, we got you. We'll be outside a safe way with our, um, getting people to sign petitions. There's a lot of coalition. There's a lot of women, um, Latinas, who show up during war on poverty funds distribution in black neighborhoods to make sure that that money goes to the places where it needs to go. There's a lot of organizing. There's a, there's a lot of also, of course, internationalism, third world internationalism that's happening in the 60s, the 70s. But this, these are the things that don't make the history books. The cover of the Black Panther, Viva Zapata, What's that about? Like, why, why, why does this make sense to you at this time? Um, there's a lot of organizing. I just took you from the 40s to the 80s, okay? So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep it moving, but it's, I just want to let you give you a sense of why I like to look at the unseen. So just because I want us to keep this in mind. Um, 1980s, there was um, the Mothers of East Los Angeles who were organizing in opposition to the city placing a recycling center in East LA. If you know, and most, like 90% of recycling centers are in communities of color, and they cause a lot of problems. The, the glass that's so small you can't see it that's in the air, this is why asthma is so much more of a problem in communities of color, in indigenous communities, because they don't, they don't really care about our public health in the same ways that they care about people who are affluent. So. This is the organizing that's going on. This woman that you can see kind of like in the front here, she went on to become a congresswoman, Roybal. But this was in the 1980s as they were organizing on the east side. And they had a lot of wins together. They had some losses too, but they had a lot of wins together. So how do you write about the losses and the realities of the friction and the tension that's created, not just because people have different and shared and also competing interests, but because of the white supremacy that posits us against one another so that we don't work together. When people realize that, and in a flash, they begin, oh, let's organize around this one issue. What's it, what is it that brings us together right now? Climate, climate justice. What is it that brings us together here? Reproductive justice. Here, um, abolition, mass incarceration, gun violence. Wherever it can happen, these coalitions, they happen. And don't let people tell you that that is not true. And this is why this book became so important, I think, for the people who, who um, saw themselves in it. And I say that um, self-consciously, but also proudly, because um, the, the, the thing that people saw in it most of the time was the music. So I, there's a lot of music in that book. So now we're on to part two. So uh, I, after that, I wrote this. I co-edited a book with, with Alex Lubin, who's a longtime friend of mine. And we had all these wonderful people who agreed to, out of love, agreed to write about how Cedric Robinson's work impacted them. Everybody, people who I, I thought, I, I was so surprised, said yes. But why they said yes? Because of the love that they have for this great theorist, Cedric Robinson. Angela Davis is in it. So many people, Ruthie Gilmore wrote for us, Robin Kelly, and some amazing emergent scholars, Damien Sojoyner, Shauna Redman, who's no longer emergent, but just a badass, incredible black woman. Um, that was 2017 when that book came out. And it came out, we actually were late getting it in, but it was a good thing because in that time that we were late, is like the, that, that like four months, um, Donald Trump was elected. and so we were able to write in the preface what that meant for the futures of black radicalism. 
what we argued in the introduction to that book was that we're in this moment that was even the contrary to what a lot of people feel. It's like the last gasps of capitalism as we know it. A lot of people feel like, oh, no, we've been smothered by it. It's over. It's a wrap. It's a dirt nap for everybody who like, is a freedom fighter. It's really easy to feel overwhelmed right now and to think that that's true. But if you just look at history and the way that the black radical tradition has carried us through the darkest times, somebody in 1789 who's dreaming about freedom, who believes that it will happen one day, whose grandkids won't even see 1865, but who like, freedom, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to be the architect of a new society. We're going to design it. We're going to dream it. We're going to sing about it. We're going to preach about it. We're going to run away for it. That's where we're at also right now, is where we have to dream it, design it, believe in it, have faith in it, know it, because in the past it's happened even when people had no reference for it, but they had faith in it anyway. In honor of them, we have to not succumb to what a lot of people have been calling the crumbles of society. We're in the crumbles, climate change, all of these things that feel like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? I'm looking at y'all right here. That's what's going to happen next, is that we believe in you. We believe in you, but we're not going to put it all on you either. We can't, all of us. So we write this book in 2017, and um, we lost Cedric Robinson before it came out. But it was uh, a moment in 2017, then Donald Trump comes, he takes office, right? And I had been off for the fall quarter. So I was thinking, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to teach because I, I knew I had 600 and something students waiting for me in the winter quarter. And I was teaching the introduction to Chicana Chicano Studies. So I come in January thinking, how, could, how bad could it get? <laughs> right? Awful, awful. Within the first two weeks, Muslim ban, anti-immigration stuff. I mean, it's like he's just rolling it out, right? And my students are in real time. They're 18, 19, 20, 21. And they've never seen this before. They just came out of eight years of Barack Obama. They just came out of eight years of a different kind of representation altogether. I have students in hijab who are like, I'm going home for Christmas. Can I? I went home for Christmas. I can't get back. I mean, this is the reality, right? My parents are undocumented, and they need to drop my six-year-old sister off at the school every morning, and they're afraid to go to the parking lot because ICE is waiting. They don't want to go to the grocery store. They, don't want to, they, they feel so confined. Uh, what's our contingency plan for when people get picked up in our family? How many people are going into foster care in, in 2017 because their parents are being detained. Um, these are all immediate questions within like the first two, three weeks of the quarter. And I had this whole syllabus mapped out, let me tell you, because I've been teaching about race and racism and like, I'm like the liberation professor and I come in, oh, she's amazing, oh my gosh, she got a story. And I come in and I realize I'm teaching this stuff about white supremacy. I'm teaching all this history that I know, the story of enslaved people and like the brutality and the lynching and the things that immigrants have gone through and the da 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 da. I'm watching their faces and they're going, crying. And I think, let me stop. In you know, my whole career, I had never just, I'm wrong here. So I'm wrong here. I'm the one talking about these things and naming them. I'm wrong because something is not, something's disconnecting here. My students are in a state of trauma at this moment. So I had to step back and pause, right? And, you know, I just thank all my ancestors, my parents, all my, my friends and, and circles of organizers that I know, community workers, and especially artists who are like, you could change it up. You could stop right here, do something different. Paint that over, D record that differently, change that note. Whoops, yeah, we heard that on the track, you know, whatever. I tried to learn something from them. So I stepped back and I was like, what do we need right now? We need community, right? We need all the people who were in this first book of mine. We need to get people in here telling these folks, you're gonna be okay. We're going to be all right, right? So, which becomes, right, the y'all laughing, because 
right? Um, because Kendrick Lamar. And then we get one thing after another, after another, don't we? We were tired, tired at 18, 19, tired, eyes red, tired. And um, so I just said, okay, let's, let's talk about what we do do well. So, oh my goodness, my, my friends that are musicians and artists showed up. Ernesto Llerena came. Fabiano Rodriguez, Julio Salgado, um, Quetzal. Um, folks just came to the class like, yeah, I'm come, I talk about my art, let's go. And people like, I've never seen myself represented on a classroom stage before, what? Never seen Ballet Folklorico, never seen the tarima on, on the stage before in a classroom. This is my delight, right? And my delight because what the artist told me, this is what you need. This is what you need to do. Like, let, let us show you, right? So what is the role of the public facing institution? Whether it's a school, a museum, anything. What is the role of a public institution in a time of crisis? And I think we owe ourselves the mercy of looking to history, but also to art, because that's where the, that's where the love and the heart and the motivation and the rest happens. So one thing that many organizers talk about, and um, then I'm going to come to this story, then we're going to do a little practice, and then we'll end, um, is that we have these cycles where we identify a problem. We can identify like 50, 11 problems right now. And then we think, okay, we got we to gotta do this because nobody's coming to save us. We're going to save ourselves. So let's organize. Let's get it. Let's get it in. We all come together. We work, posters, platforms, statements, press releases, all the things, meetings, town halls, all that, right? Action, protest, but, but like what's the goal? And we get things done. We get things changed, not because of the mercy of uh, usually city, state, national governments, but because the people say, no more. Mm -mm. We're doing it this way now. We've had enough. We do that. It's exciting, exhilarating. It shows us our power. And then we, we get tired. So we get to this point in that cycle where we need to rest. The problem the organizers have been telling me, is like, we don't spend enough time in that space <laughs> of rest and refuge. What happens in that space of rest and refuge? When you rest, it's not that you're not working. It's not that you're not thinking. You're, maybe you're playing, which is the wonderful time I spent at the Tezuke Mountain Center. We played. It was amazing. It was so amazing to play. Got so much laughter. Capacity increases. Your mind settles. Your heart feels good, more full. Rest. There's a politics and a radicalism in rest that has been underestimated. Why? I could tell you so many reasons. Capitalism, one of them, is like, you know, scarcity culture, urgency culture. We got to get done at this time. It's urgent. If you don't do it now, if you don't buy this right now, there's only one left. You, you know, you're not, you're not going to have this thing for this thing tonight, a fast fashion, all that stuff, all the time, right? Instagram, scrolling, 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 quick, 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 quick. Afterpay, all those things, right? Part of the same thing. Fast, quick, hurry. You don't have time. People in power, they got infinite time. Why do they have infinite, endless time? Because they're the ones that make the scene. That's manifest destiny. It's like unending time because we're making a new society. But we don't get time. We do time, right? We got, we got a little bit of time to get a whole lot done. We get a tiny bit of time at the mic, so we got to say all the things or else it's not going to get right. We have so much pressure, so we got to take our time. One of the things I learned as I then moved into this new part of the, that was very transformative was time, space, music, what it becomes for us in that place of rest. So I gave this talk at the Endelon National Day Labor Organizing Network's annual Assemblea. Afterwards, there was this march to downtown LA to the jail. And people were giving testimonial about some of their loved ones that were in detention right then. And then people started noticing, probably people have heard this story, because this isn't the only place it happened. People started noticing, knocking, people knocking from the inside, like, we're here, we can hear you, right? 
people start holding up signs, los amo, right? Even their case numbers, help me, you know. So what does Endalon do? They decide, this is what we, we, we need to come back here and we need to put on concerts for these folks because so, they can hear us. They can hear us. We need to be here for them. We need to show them we love them. They're not forgotten. So even if they are deported, we're here. We're a few blocks from where they live and they're here detained. We're here for you. Look outside the window. Music can penetrate walls. Music is a home that you'll never be evicted from. So concerts, people start making these concerts. And then it's not just downtown LA, it's prisons all over. People start doing this. So this transformation for me was profound because all my professional life, I've, I started out at UT San Antonio in the history department. And I was telling Rashawn, I was like, one day ahead of the students. <laughs> like when I first started, I was like just out of grad school and I was just like imposter syndrome all up in everywhere. And then my next um, job was at UC Santa Barbara in Black Studies. And then I was like minding my own business and UCLA is like, hey, what, what are you doing? You wanna come work with us? Like, what? I didn't even get into UCLA. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And I couldn't, I, I was like floored and I go there because a lot of my intellectual heroes are there. And you talk about the place where you're your resume matters more than your life, <laughs> okay? A lot of jobs are like that, right? This is why talking to y'all young people, make sure you hold on to that resistance that I know a lot of you have. Like, I'm not gonna end up like y'all. My job is not gonna kill me, good. Stick with that because it's not, burnout is not pretty. And it's something that, the only thing that really brings you back is the love of your, your accomplices and your comrades, your friends, your family. And um, yet, here I was in this place when Donald Trump was elected. And here I was in this classroom with access eventually to almost 900 students at a time. Why am I here? What's my role when I step back and I ask myself, what's my role now? Before it was all the things on my Vita, all the things on my resume, the professor, the two books, the like, no, I'm not saying, I'm not putting that down, but I'm saying, I did the show. I did, I did it and it was hard, but it was good work. And I'm glad that I learned those skills because it also gave me a little bit of a pass, a little legitimacy in the, this kind of prestige seduction that is a lot of our life, right? It's like, oh, if I get this thing, it makes me this. No, I, didn't, I learned from artists and musicians and young people that that is not my life, that is not my worth, that's not my value. And um, I ended up asking really just like, like what is the next thing? I don't know if a, being a professor anymore is for me, but I have a lot of respect for the profession. And then I did this webinar called Abolition on Stolen Land. It was about mass incarceration and the relationship to the land back movement. And there was somebody that was watching in the virtual audience who I had met many years before who was an organizer with the um, Bus Riders Union in LA, the Labor Strategy Center. And he reached out and he said, hey, guess what? So all these years have gone by. Yeah, I was an organizer for them. And uh, then I became a, a, a life, like a coaching for healing, justice, and liberation coach. And, and then my last cohort that I trained, they they challenged us to create our own school. So the first cohort starts in a couple of months. What do you think? You want to be part of it? I was like, hell yeah, sign me up. I want to do, I want to do, this. maybe this is the thing I've been thinking. It's like, what's my next thing? That was, that was the sort of like um, beginning of the beginning for me of now, what's the role of the educator and where are we right now today? What can I, how can I use what I have and what I've learned? How can I take it anywhere? just like these musicians are taking and understanding that even if we don't have a permit to be right in front of the jail, we can stand across the street and sing to you. We can have a birthday party, these three sons for our father outside, and he can see us. 
con el canto penetra, uh, penetramos muros. We can penetrate walls. Right? We can take this anywhere. Sound travels even when people cannot. So I'm still like marinating in those ideas. I don't know I'll, always like where I'm going. All I know is that now I get to do all this amazing coaching with people and I get to talk to organizers more and I get to focus on somatics and think more and more about what artists have been doing for so long, which is getting us out of here so much. And I heard this amazing saying, I can't remember who said it, too many words are heavy on the page. And that is what I've been pondering. So now I wonder what is the role of, my, what is my role as an educator? What is the role of a public facing institution? So my teaching changed. And I saw, I, the next class I did, First, I went to my friends that are organizers, and I said, what does your organi organization need? One organization, Mateo 25, was working with asylum seekers, and they need, like, right now, they're like, well, we need, we don't know how to use Twitter. And I was like, we can help you with that. I got 800 students that would love to teach you, to hold, do a whole social media plan for you. I went to California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. They said, we need somebody to tell people who live in South East LA, where they can get an abortion if they need to go get an abortion. We can do that. In fact, my students were like, we could do the whole LA County. And they did, they did the whole LA County. For, and um, Hunger Action LA, who helps seniors get to farmers markets with their food stamps, they needed people who could lead them through the farmers market because they were low vision seniors. We could do that. We got so many students who would love to do that. Women on Skid Row, Downtown Women's Action Network. They needed a survey done. They needed people who weren't afraid to go in the community. They needed people who identify as men to stand back and let people who identify as women go and ask women and children in tents about, about anything, their reproductive health, school, where they sleep at night. We can do that. So how do I then design what I, I think, I used to think, oh, UCLA, blah, 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 big lights, you know. I'm liberating resources, yes, absolutely, but I was doing it the wrong way. I was giving so much labor to my community partners. Now, the community partners are giving me the labor and then I'm meeting them with the resources and what's happening? The students are going from like, oh my God, we're here to learn about race and race. oh my God, oh my God, we're gonna lead these low vision seniors to the farmer's market, oh my God, we're winning, we just figured out where anybody can go in anywhere in LA County to get an abortion if they need to. We just figured out how to get asylum seekers reunited with their children. We just figured out how to, to organize the files in the um, restorative justice um, organization that does circles with incarcerated people. We just learned that we could make one minute videos for their social media page. We can build a website for these people because it's all run by people over 60 and they don't know anything about social media. So we can do that too. They did so many incredible projects and they went from this to this and they made logos and art and music for so, and so from then on, that's it. Any class I teach, that's how we do it. Eight people, 800, we're all doing stuff with community. I share this with you because I came to that uh, through a fire, like a real fire, a crisis of my own identity as somebody who had prestige, somebody who like had all the degrees and had the pedigree and the blah, 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 and the privilege too, the privilege. And I was humbled and in a, in a hard way sometimes, but also in a beautiful way by my students and by the people when I just asked, what do you need? It wasn't what I thought they needed, me, the like expert in like um, cities. Oh, she's an expert on the blah, blah, and race in the city. And like, yes, right? But only to academics, because then you ask the organizers, and they're like, oh, whatever, girl. Sis, let me tell you what we need, really, truly. We need a web page, okay? We need you to write a grant. All that writing you do in those books, whatever, those bookity books you write about us, we need you to transfer some of that writing to this grant proposal. Can you do that? I can. So this is, the, this is the new thing, I'm marinating. I want to hear your stories too. This is why it's so powerful to hear what you're doing, Kyle. Also, Santa Fe Opera, what all of these folks are doing, what Rashan is doing, 
what Joanne is doing, what David is doing, the Mountain Center is doing. So, you know, I'm listening to you all this whole time because I'm learning, 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 learning. So, here we are. What does it mean to come together heartbroken today? Let's take a breath together. A breath. Let's feel, if it's accessible to you, let's feel the earth under our feet. Our feet. Our feet. See, I'm six again. Our feet. I'm second, third, fourth grade. Our feet. Let's feel the power that the earth gives us. Let's feel power of our hearts. Let's put our hands over our hearts. Let's breathe into that power for a moment. And I, I know I'm over time, but keeping your hands on your hearts, I'm going to ask you to do something together, okay? So it, if you're sitting in a group of three, it's fine. It's a group of two, whatever, either doubles or triples. I want you to just turn to one another. Just turn to one another, no words, okay? I'm not gonna ask you to say anything or introduce each yourselves or anything. Just turn, just make eye contact really quick. Okay, yeah, good, all right. So the cool thing I learned about in coaching for healing justice and liberation, in restorative circles, this is why it's important to do this work in prisons, in schools, everywhere you can, because in restorative justice, no one is disposable. Nobody. We don't throw our people away. We, we bring them into the circle. Now, if you can't forgive them, it's okay. You know why? Because they can still do the work of transformation without you having to be there present and responsible for it. So restorative transformative justice, it's not the answer to everything for everybody. But sometimes you can practice it and it makes a difference. You can coach, you can be with, in community with each other without words, right? So this is what I'm gonna ask you to do, is without words, first we'll all start here. If you're in threes or twos, make eye contact as your hello, as I see you. That's, that's the message, so go ahead, I invite you to look at each other now. Hello, I see you, in your mind, your heart, I see you, I'm here. I'm here, you're here. Thank you for being here. This is the message, through your eyes only, okay? Now I want you to change your position from your heart to give us a nonverbal for how you're feeling today, a nonverbal. Me, it's tears are welcome here. So for me, I would do this but I would also do this because I'm happy to be here and with you. So with whoever you've made eye contact with, give them a nonverbal. Okay. Ah, I see this. Mm -hmm. And you, you know what that means, right? What are some other nonverbals that people chose? Some people chose to stay here in their heart. Other folks? Smile. Mm -hmm. This else. I saw somebody. Oh. Heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, look again at the people around you. Give them a nonverbal, what you wish for them. What do you wish for them? Uh. Uh -huh. I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big smiles. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
love. Mm -hmm. People hugging. Mm -hmm. mm. These things can travel. They, they have so much power. They can travel between the living and the dead. You can be that interlocutor, the person in between. And what's in the space in between is going to be love, always. You can take it anywhere. It's um, so important for us to understand that sometimes you don't need words, right? You, just, you need art. But I'm not going to end there. I'm going to end with this, which is someone else's words. A poem by Brendan Constantine, The Opposites Game. Anybody heard this before? I just came across this. And then I'll, I'll end, let him end. This day, he's a teacher. This day, my students and I play the opposites game with a line from Emily Dickinson. My life had stood a loaded gun. It goes, and I write it on the board, pausing so they can call out the antonyms. My life had stood a loaded gun. My antonym is your. Life, antonym is death. Had stood, will sit, a many. Loaded, empty, gun, gun. For a moment, very much like the one between lightning and its sound, the children just stare at me. And then it comes, a flurry, a hailstorm of answers. Flower, says one. Nope, book, says another. That's stupid, cries a third. The opposite of a gun is a pillow. Or maybe a hug, but not a book. No way is it a book. With this, the others gather their thoughts. And suddenly, it's a shouting match. No one can agree. For every student, there's a final answer. It's a song. It's a prayer. I mean, it's a promise, like a wedding ring, and later, a baby. Oh, what's that person who delivers babies? A midwife. Yes, the opposite of a gun is a midwife. Nope, that's wrong. You're so wrong, you'll never be right again. It's a whisper. It's a star. It's saying, I love you, into your hand, and then touching someone's ear. Are you crazy? Are you the president of stupid land? You should be. When's the election? It's a teddy bear, a sword, a perfect, perfect peach. Go back to the first one. It's a flower. It's a white rose. When the bell rings, I reach for an eraser, but a girl snatches it from my hand. Nothing's decided. <laughs> We're not done here. I leave all the answers on the board. The next day, some of them have stopped talking to each other. They've taken sides. There's a flower cup. cup. There's a kitten club, and two boys calling themselves the snowballs. The rest have stuck with the original game, which was to try to write something like poetry. It's a diamond, it's a dance. The opposite of a gun is a museum in France. It's the moon, it's a mirror, it's the sound of a bell and the hearer. The arguing starts again, more shouting, and finally a new club. For the first time, I dare to push them. Maybe all of you are right, I say. Well, maybe. Maybe it's everything we said. Maybe it's everything we didn't say. It's words and the space is for words. They're looking at each other now. It's everything in this room and outside this room and down the street and in the sky. It's everyone on campus and at the mall and all the people waiting at the hospital and at the post office. And yeah, it's a flower too. All the flowers, the whole garden, the opposite of a gun is wherever you point it. So now I get to hear from you, <laughs> just to be in community with you, some a little bit through tears and love, um, and also happy to answer questions. Thank you for that amazing talk. Thank you. Um, so I come from a small community in northern New Mexico, mm -hmm. and which is very, doesn't have the most means, I would say. And we all, I would say a majority of us identify as Chicano, you know? And, you know, I've thought about how I want my community to be and how I want it to, how I want to shape my community and how to influence and be a positive influence. What does it mean to be a Chicano for you in LA? And what would you suggest is the, the starting mark for someone who doesn't quite know their identity in a space where 
American, like Americanism and manifest destiny has kind of taken more hold than not. Mm, that's so powerful. Thank you for putting it that way. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of times with any birth of like this identity, which is so powerful, and like you're so lucky because all of these, you have all these ancestors who are like not are living and dead, you know, but are like both, like they're all here for you. They all they live their lives in many of them. Um, very much embodied in Chicanismo. So you've got all of these options to choose from. So the first step, I think, is what is asking yourself, why does this matter to me? Like, what, what about this gives me fire? You want something for your community. What is it? That's, that's the first question. It's like, what is it that I want? And who am I in that vision? What's my role? What's my purpose? And the, the amazing thing about uh, Chicano history and identity is like it was it was forged in struggle, but it was also forged in the beauty of cumbia and like all the things that we do, the accordion, the you know the harana, like all the things, um, it, the intersection of a lot of identities. But I start there because you have Chicana feminists. You've got some incredible, like, queer punk Chicanos that do incredible music um, that are just changing everything out there from, um, from gang injunctions to backyard parties, you know. So first, I think, asking yourself, what gives me fire about being a Chicano? What, um, what where do I get that fire? Where were the sparks along that historical line? Who do I want to know a little bit more about? Who are my models? And who do I want to be a model for? For me, once I started answering those questions, like it's a lifelong thing. In college, it meant one thing to me. And now it means a little something different because in the last few years, we changed our department name to Chicanx and Central American Studies because LA is changing. And so we have to, we have so many Central Americans who became Chicano Studies majors because there was no Central American Studies. So we're the first PhD program in the country to, to offer Central American Studies. That's a big like change right now. We got to figure out, can we still be Chicano in a, a city of Central Americans? That, that means something different. But the core of it is pride, I think. So it's like, I could go on for a whole quarter about this. Great question. Thank you. So I loved the part of um, how music played and broke down walls. So um, Native Americans, that's a big part of our people is the songs, the dances, the chanting. And um, it's also a language barrier as well, too, because it connects people of all over the country with music as well too. And um, I thought that was really something powerful to come across of like, what's your playlist? What's, what's your music? What's your song? Yeah. That, was, that was really powerful. And then also too of, um, you know, when people were extracted from their lands in Los Angeles, um, it kind of brought me back because my dad was a product of the relocation where they took Native Americans and wanted to, you know, colonize them or, you know, make them urban to where they knew that they could come back and have a trait or something, you know, to fall back on when they came back home. And, um, you know, there was several of a lot of families that were relocated all over. One of them was Los Angeles. One of them was up in Utah and, you know, different places. And it was just... A whole different world for for them to be out there and come back and have that experience and I come to think that if my dad didn't have that experience he, we probably wouldn't have been so rich in other people's culture foods music everything you know and then um, you spoke of the low riders uh, you know there's a debate Espanola in Los Angeles <laughs> 
low rider capital of the world. Yep. <laughs> and I, we yep. own a low rider. We own a 57 Chevy. Nice. And nice. Um, the paint job that's going to be on there is my dad's artwork, his traditional native artwork. Oh. Because that's something you display. And yeah. his designs have been passed on from his parents as well, too. So that's what's going to be on on our oldie as well too but there's just so many similarities here with what you spoke of and um how it just impacts us all or how we're connected and you know you're you say you know you you have a gift you were you were trying to find out what you were to give back and i think with um me and my husband here jordan i think one of the things that i come to realize what i'm my purpose is here some one of the purpose is to educate people about our native american culture our people because um living in santa fe we have so many people of diverse um i mean people coming from all over and they tend to forget what new mexico is it's pueblo it's tewa it's native american you know um a lot of people don't know that you know during the United States, during presidents, you know, Abraham Lincoln, and he, the the Pueblos were treated differently than Plains Indians in South Dakota, North Dakota, because they saw the Pueblo people established. They saw they had a constitution. They saw that they had a government working. So they, Lincoln left a lot of the Pueblos alone here and had that relationship where he gave canes as recognitions as um were friends and versus other people that maybe more tribes that were nomads or you know and a lot of people don't understand that the whole architect the food the culture the designs came from you know the pueblos here as well too and i think that's a part of you know with our family and our kids is to educate people and to tell them, you know, what our purpose is here. You know, my grandparents, my great grandma always told us we're here put on earth to be protectors of the land and of people, not just our own people, but everybody. And a lot of people forget that, even our own people. You know, it's, and I'm sure it happens with all kinds of cultures because you're never, like with us, it's like you're never Indian enough or you're only half Indian, but you're not full Indian. So we get ridicule, ridiculed within our own community as well, too, you know. So it's, it's always the big thing is to educate people and ask questions. We always tell people, ask questions. You know, if there's some things we can't tell you, we'll, we'll tell you. You know, that's, we can't, we're not allowed to tell you, but we'll explain the best that we can to you. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for being an educator. Thank you. I just learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to see that car. Too. Truck. Oh, truck. Oh, yeah, that's right. My name is Jordan Harvier. Uh, my wife was just the one who spoke. But uh, <clears throat> I do just want to piggyback off of her because everything that you were saying and what you were talking about, we really relate to <clears throat> as Indian people from here in New Mexico. I mean, everything you're talking about is exactly like what we're trying to share with everybody. Like she said, we try to share who we are because I think that's the the number one thing that everybody in this world should always know is who you are, where you come from, what you're about. And if you don't know, well, you can always learn or you can always find out. You know, there's always somebody there to teach you and help you. You may hear a lot of no's, but there's always going to be a yes somewhere, you know. And that's what we're all about, is teaching people who we are and where we come from. Like you said, pride. Pride in who you are. I mean, we're not ashamed of who we are, and, and we show it. And we're there to teach people who we are. Because sharing is what we're all about. That's what we're here for, like she said. We're here to share with everybody who we are, what we are what we know, and like with healing, you know, that's a big thing with with Indian people. We're all about healing and sharing and being generous to each other, but it's not just for ourselves, it's for everybody. 
and that's one thing that we need to continue to share with everybody is you know these lessons that we all learn because it's not just for one race or anything it's for all people you know the human race what people say it's all people we're all one one person you know we, we're different colored skins textures whatever but we're all still the same we all bleed red you know but that's what we're here for is just to teach people who we are and where we come from because there's so many similarities between all the cultures and that kind of gets me going into working with Kyle and the Santa Fe Opera I mean there's so many similarities there with the opera I mean basically us as native peoples we have our own operas too you know we have our songs and with the songs come stories and then we actually act them out through dances so it's like we pretty much have operas it's just done a little different and i think that's where we're starting to you know build that that gap you know that bridge with the santa fe opera and let them know hey this is what we're about this is what we have and this is where you guys are as well let's put it all together you know because new mexico is such a it's such a different place from everywhere else. There's so many different cultures here. The landscape is different. And I think a lot of people that come here, like my wife mentioned, don't really know exactly where they're at or what is here. You know, and like she kind of touched base on the food, you know, even the architect, you know, around here, all the buildings, everything that's contemporary. If you ever go to a Pueblo here in New Mexico, it's basically the same thing. It's just contemporized here but people don't know that. Mm. But again, thank you for what you're doing and from, for what you said. And like you said, pride. That's a big one right there. Mm -hmm. Be prideful in who you are and where you come from because the more you know about yourself and your roots and where you do come from, you'll find out there's a lot of similarities between all of us and we can all share that and learn from each other. Yeah. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. there so nice to meet you nice to meet um you. thank you for tonight i just had um i'm just curious as far as music what inspired you growing up what you listened to how you kind of came to understand that music was the thing the core that kind of held people together thank you for that question i wish really should just ask my dad to speak because <laughs> he's here but i they they just exposed me to so much so many different kinds of music from all over the world uh, but also the music of the time when they felt the spark. Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Wonder, Santana, the Isley Brothers, the Commodores, um, Bob Marley, uh, the Wild Chapatulas, New Orleans music. Um, every, so, so, you know, it's like you're in your living room in, and you're, you're in fifth, sixth grade and you're listening. I used to come home from school and I would listen to um, Stevie Wonder, a Prince, or like, and that, and, but then like, the very first time I ever felt represented in a classroom was when a professor played a song that I had only ever heard in my parents' living room before. I never heard it on the radio. It, that was the first time I was like, oh, um, and I didn't even know at that point, like, what do I want to be, or do I want to be a professor? I just knew I wanted to do for other people what he did for me, which was to recognize me and my just my life as having a place in a university. So that was some of the music. I think. Thanks for that question. Thank you for being here Thank and you. being so open. Um, I guess my question is about differences and similarities and how to bring people together, um, particularly in, in the way I tend to think, I think while bringing people together in a certain way via similarities and saying things like we are one is a bit dangerous because it's the same principle that leads to nationalism and extremism and white supremacy. And on the other hand, it seems that it also is very useful to bring people together, you know? So yeah, I, I was wondering how you see it in practice in mobilizing people and talking to people and teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I would say that one of the things that, um, that makes a difference between uh, people coming together and 
the nationalism that evolves or devolves, that becomes white supremacy, is that um, you got to have a very particular kind of power to uh, enact a racist regime that can then stay in power for many hundreds of years. You have to have a particular kind of power, but you also have to have a particular intention. The intention of white supremacy or nationalism is never to unify. It's power over. But the intention of people coming together out of struggle is power among. So I, I don't worry too much, although sometimes you will hear, I don't worry too much when people come together on, a, on the basis of like, hey, they told us this is where we actually divide, but maybe that's where we actually, there's a place where we come together, there's something missing. Um, what's the, what, what song is it, or what food do you share? This was another thing that came out of the farmer's markets once people realized, because a lot of seniors who um, are inside, the, the, the laws and the policies changed so quickly around food aid, so they didn't even know that their food stamps were um, usable at farmer's markets. And what people started seeing with pop-up farmer's markets in places like Pueblo, Pueblo del Rio in, in LA, which is a, a low-income housing project, was that people from different countries would come and buy the same vegetable, but they use it so differently. So they're, oh, what do you cook with that? So this is like another opportunity for community. That's very different from like, let's see how we can get these uh, white people in 1867 um, to abandon their alliances with black people who are in the same class. Let's see if we could get them to feel different as white people, even though they're just as poor and they're farming the same land. Let's see if we can get them to a lie based on race instead of class. This is something that Du Bois talks about. Karl Marx talks about how the ghosts of all the dead generations of nationalism in particular, they come back um, even as you're trying to make something new. They, the, it's like they, they're reinvented, those ghosts of nationalism. So how do, we, how, do, how do we get out of that pattern? We have to realize first and foremost that we didn't make this context of competition. That's a one that is empowered, enacted, animated by capitalism and white supremacy, urgency, scarcity, all of that. And a lot of us, we don't know any different. So, but maybe we could try something different. Maybe we could have faith in each other and say, yeah, what do you make with that green pepper? If you add this instead of this, then what does it make? What stew or what stir fry? I, I, I don't, I think again, the too many words can be heavy on the page. Let's just get it in, let's do it, see what happens. Let's make that art together, you know. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Gay, thank and you. thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thanks.